All right, and welcome to another episode of Makers on Tap, the first episode where the intro music didn't screw up in about six months. Woo! <laughs> it's a good omen. It must be a Bones Day. I'm so jazzed. Hell yeah. <laughs> uh today with us i'm your host joe and uh who is also with us uh all right chris and sanjay i'm uh, your host I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I'm so jazzed to have sanjay back with us again um and unfortunately we don't have a lot of time to sit and ramble like we have in the past but um i'm sure I'll we just will take get off, off to you um i would we'll just that- that could work. That could totally work. <laughs> the Sanjay only podcast. We're going to just have you just ranting about movies, podcasts, just whatever you want. <laughs> Man, that'd be a that'd be an interesting one. You should do that. I'll, I'll help you set it up. It'll be good. Damn we can do it as an offshoot if you yeah. want. <laughs> you you just moved your shoulder. What is that machine in behind you? That is the first ever Mendel 90 that I built. wondered. Um, <laughs> oh. so this is horrible. Well, it was even horribler. It used to have aluminium tube, anodized aluminium tube as linear shafting. Um, nice. Did it have yes. did it have roller bearings? Like like LMU oh. bearings or did it have sleeves? Oh god. <laughs> it was very loud. It was very loud. Um, but it has some nice features like a Dibon bed. Um, uh, yeah, Mendel 90s. That, nice machines. That's amazing. I, re- I really wish I still had my first Prusa Mendel. Uh, I tried to buy it back from the kid I sold it to a bunch of years ago, and he had already stripped it down for parts. Yeah. <laughs> One day. But yeah, so. Um, what have you been up to? You've done a lot of interviews lately, so I don't want to rehash those. But in the last few weeks, you guys have launched Revo. You've teased a tiny Hamera. You teased some new nozzles that are just like baller. And I can't wait to see. Um, yeah. Uh, I beta tested Revo in like all of its revisions. And oh, wow. it. it's on that machine and that machine and uh yeah those are the only two that i currently have it on right now so that's what printed most of the parts for the thing i'm making right yeah yeah Yeah. it's insane (laughs) they printed all of the the milk crate uh parts all of the revisions of the prototypes uh Mm. yeah (laughs) trooper yeah yeah i would have we been up to i in, in the round, there's been like this big kind of COVID constipation of things that have been in development for quite some time. And somehow, despite best efforts, they all seem to be ready all at once. Um, so fair. Yeah. Like Revo <laughs> validation finished just in time for TCT um, for us to be 100% that. Um, those last few bugs um, were ironed out. You're probably aware of, of those ones. Um, yeah. That was a tough nut to crack. I mean, that, yeah. but that's what we do, right? Like, like we work on it, we work on it, we work on it. And then there's like, oh, well, there, here's this deadline. So let's just get it. It's yeah. finally that last push. And <laughs> to the point where I was like burning the candle at both ends. Like, I had to take like a week and a half off just to like, after TC just like crash and like well deserved <laughs> yeah. yeah um but yeah that that got done obsidian has just passed all of its final validation i think um there's some like coatings are hard um uh-huh. both, both figuratively and literally it, that unintentional but yeah could yeah but uh, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of deep magic in there and like just things that to us were unknown unknowns um mm-hmm. uh, but i'm glad it failed here in the testing program because they would have sucked uh, um, again it's what we do <laughs> yeah um 
there's a whole other product. Oh yeah, <laughs> that one we're not talking about yet. Um, I want to hear about that offline. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I guess yeah. like the the first thing. So the V6 came out in what 2013? 14, 13? 14? I, Somewhere in there. Around that. So yeah. so how long have you guys been working on on the on Revo like since the span? Like wh- when did you go okay we have this new idea. We want to kick this off. When did you guys start working on, on Revo? That's a very blurry thing. I guess the longest lead tech was the develop our own heater and sensor um, manufacturing and assembly capability in-house. Um, mm-hmm. And that is still... I think you know the the that's the most technically complex part of the system. Um, I, I guess if you look at Revo and a and a Revo heater, like you, you could design that in like five minutes with a sharpie, right? It's just like a, there's, mm-hmm. you've got like the filament is round, so you make a round hole, and then you have to get the hot into it, and so you. You know, you may have put a hot maker and so you a circular hot maker goes around the round hole and, oh, I have to do a sensor somewhere in here and we'll find somewhere to shove that in. Um, mm-hmm. That is not exactly the most, like, a difficult CAD. You know, you look at Revo yeah. it's just a, it's a ring, right? Um, yeah, it's intuitive design. But... One extreme of industry to look at perhaps is automotive. In automotive, you don't so much design products. The main thing that you're designing or the innovation is in the manufacturing process. Um, Mm -hmm. And V6 was very much a product design exercise um, within the constraints of manufacturing that other people did. Um, And as we mature and scale, and have to compete on price and quality and things like that that are part of like part and parcel with manufacturing. Um, then we kind of have to, you know, the amount of product design gets like slightly trimmed down and the amount of manufacturing engineering mm-hmm. um, comes in and that'll, you know, be, be a creeping thing um, as, as it is in all maturing industries. Um, I mean, I, look at look at a, a Dreamliner looks pretty similar to a McDonnell Douglas DC, like one, two, like the numbers. You know the ones. Like yep, they're not changed. Yep. They look, look the same. Um, but you know, materials and manufacturing have changed. Just they're just unrecognizable from back then. Um, right. And that's really what's driving um the, the the improvements in like range sustainability um passenger comfort and the like and for us as we exhaust design optimization which is an easy and cheap target um then one bumps into the fundamentals of what the process and the constraints of that process so you like you start bumping up against that um, And with V6, we, a lot of changes did happen to V6 and we optimized it and there was a lot of like tweaking, it's kind of a moving target. Um, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we even changed the manufacturing process quite significantly. Um, But you get into this, like, you just reach a natural point where like progression and making big advances is just no longer, you have this like mutual interdependent yeah. constraint thing going on. Um, so like, that's kind of, it's an interesting point. We talked about this in the past, uh, just you and I, but like the, you, you kind of hit a point where you've like out designed V6 and you're no longer designing around commodity materials. And the industry has gotten to the point now where we could design around needs instead of commodities. Yes. And that's where Revo went, right? It, exactly. Um, and so 
I guess the need is for an extrusion system that isn't painful to the user. Um, right. And back when, you know, it was very enthusiastic folk with a great deal of mechanical experience, the amount of pain caused by the need for, you know, using multiple tools and mm -hmm. dealing with hot parts is kind of lower because um, there are a whole smorgasbord of other things that are horrible. Right. Um, but, as, <laughs> yeah. you know, those horribles diminish and we introduce things like, you know, auto bed leveling and slices that are really well, uh, like tuned and tweaked and the user interface and experience there has improved. Um, we just felt like the biggest... We, we felt like extrusion systems were, I don't know, it's bias and very like extrusion system centric and will be, you know, mm -hmm. um, that, that's us. But we felt like the usability and user experience of extrusion systems was kind of one of the big things that still, still kind of sucked. Yeah. You guys took a lot of feedback. Like I guess that I was part of basically every version of this beta. And it was really interesting to see how you broke down the different design characteristics of the extrusion system. Every beta had a subtle tweak to a specific part of the hot end. There were several rounds. Yeah. And you were really diligent about taking user feedback on the specific things. And every revision, you could see thoughtful iteration into those things and like see design changes that mattered. And my favorite part was you brought back groove mount. Even though you hate it so much, you brought back group <laughs> because because the beta rounds cried for it. You know, they, there were so many of us, me included, who like our only negative feedback was, "I don't have any way to mount this stupid thing to my mass of existing extrusion systems." Yeah, and a, give me back groove mount at least for an option. You know, yeah, and, and so. <laughs> Groove mount is only only present in the kind of V6 compatibility layer version. Right, of the yeah, system. exactly. Um, but we there is no Revo Micro, which is the more optimized smaller heatsink with groove mount on it. Um, yeah, yeah. But I love the idea of being able to drop in the new technology into the hundreds of thousands of existing printers so that we can experience things like quick change and uh you know all the great <laughs> things that come from that because being able to drop in a new nozzle instantly it, it, it's a complete game changer it they completely changed how i designed parts how i looked at my processes how i stacked up my prints um yeah, it was fantastic. And it, yeah, I think that's the, the thing that we were targeting from the very, very start is that fundamental shift in user behavior towards the printer and extrusion system right from the, I see a problem and now I'm in kind of like that design, solve, manufacture mm -hmm. loop. And I'm kind of implicitly thinking about resolution and nozzle size and things like that, because, you know, by there, there are very large gains to be had. Um, yeah. If you can design your part around a 0.6 over a 0.4, you can actually barely tell visually a lot of the time I find, mm -hmm. um, but your print times are halved. Right. It's yeah. Not yeah. yeah. Um, what well, was yeah, interesting that going from a 0.4 to a 0.6 is an unintuitively large leap because it's a square factor of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, there's, there's lots of intricacies in that, but I mean, fundamentally, you know, geometrically, there is a square factor change. So. Yeah, and that all comes down to flow rate and push rates and like 
melt factors. And it was interesting during COVID, um, one of the other tool changer beta testers, uh, Brendan and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to treat 0.4 nozzles like 0.6 nozzles. So we didn't have to do nozzle changes, but we could crank out visors faster. Yeah. And <laughs> like it works, uh, sort of. Uh, it's not as good as a 0.6, but it does work. <laughs> yeah, and I, th I think there's a lot to be learned from that as well. There's still a lot more work to be done in nozzle geometry optimization um, because diameter isn't the whole story. That right, really yeah. It gets into a, in, into a can of worms. Um, with Revo, we've preserved um, that which was extant on V6 because it means that you can transition to Revo and not make any changes to your slicer profiles at all. And you'll end up with a system that prints the same, mm -hmm. um, if not more good -er, and you will have quick changing capability. Um, and for the most part, no changes to firmware. Uh, one of the things that was asked of me a lot when we were finally able to talk about the beta was with the rapid heat up times, did I have to redo PID wow. tunes? And I, for the large part, didn't. I did on one machine uh, because somebody asked me to, to see what it would do to my heat up times and they didn't change at all. And uh, yeah, you can, you can tune in a bit more stability into your loop, but right, the yeah. thing is it's, just so absurdly responsive and has such little like it's not just your ability to crank the gradient up it's also the dead time and mm -hmm. lag between input response um, so these things like combine to give you your control authority over the the true temperature versus the set point um, and if you have yeah. a very fast heating system, so very high wattage, um, but has a bunch of dead time in it because let's say you have a huge thermal mass, for example, um, you're going to get overshoot because the amount of time that it takes for the system to respond and notice and you guys have that loop. But I mean, you may have noticed even with an untuned PID loop, you reach your set point and then there's just like... Yeah, it's just straight. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> it, the heater graph looks like it looks like this, and yeah. then it looks like this. There's no there's no spike, and there's no wobble. It's yeah, yeah. I mean, what was really cool on the tool changer is I was able to just take out idle temps. They're just zero because by the time it calls the tool, when the head goes to pick it up, it's hot. Like yeah, it doesn't have time to cool down. <laughs> it okay. is just hot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't I don't actually know. What heat up time is? Um, it's about it's, a minute from ambient to two fifty five. Yeah, uh, more, I, I made an absurd square. claim on Twitter, and then people made me fact check it, and it's about a minute. But from like print temp to layer change on like an average multicolor tool changer print, you lose like ten to fifteen degrees, and that's damn near instant. Yeah, yeah, that so, that really is. Um, yeah. So one of the questions we got from Twitter and you actually, you, you like kind of segued into it. There was nozzle geometry. Um, so one of the things that came out right at the same time as Revo was the CHT nozzle announcement, yeah. which is a licensure of the matchless nozzle, which has been around for a while. Um, but the question was, what do you think the theoretical limits of 1.75 millimeter filament are with nozzle diameter oddities so we have like cht that's bringing it up to 1.8 or 2 millimeters with a 1.75 feedstock what kind of wildness do you think we could achieve um with something else i don't know right yeah it's an uh, interesting question <laughs> in terms of fundamental limits i think that if we assume a system with um, unlimited grip, which is a big assumption, very, very big assumption. Um, yes. You, probably your oiler column buckling limit of the cold polymer 
um, when you reach plastic deformation on the cold side due to back pressure and grip as that is probably your limiting factor. Um, okay. Now I think that's probably unrealistic, but my point is that if you, the, we if broke you can day. deal with more back pressure, you mm -hmm. will be able to melt more plastic per second by, um, doing funky things with your internal nozzle geometry. Um, ad absurdum, um, let us imagine a, a nozzle that is extremely like, so, so a 0.8 nozzle, um, but that you have a very, very long and capillary yeah, no, I, I think that argument doesn't hold water, but <laughs> you could introduce as many micro channels as you wanted, um, and yeah. really go go ham. Um, you would create more back pressure, and you probably the next thing that you bump up against is a grip limit. Um, yeah. On your extrusion I, system. Um, and then that's the manufacturing limit. Like the, the matchless is, and the, the CHT was made in a way that is like possible. I think to introduce new geometry in there, you have to start doing weird things like centering and stuff that doesn't necessarily lend itself to an efficient or an affordable manufacturing process for something like this. Yeah. Um, I, I think about things like um, through coolant channels on drills where like the coolant follows the drill flute. Yeah. And yeah. Do you know how that's done? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, for the people that don't know, a lot of those drills are made straight and then they're heated and pulled on the mandrel and twisted. Or they're centered with a, a lost process. Um, yeah, you, you take basically like fishing line. Um, yeah. And you, you twist the, you take the compacted powder blank and you, you, you twerk it like that. And so you end up with like a helical DNA strand. And then you have to like make sure that you grind it in like all in, uh, in phase. It's, a, it's <laughs> um, wild. There's a reason those drills are like $600 a piece. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's also one other weird trick. Um, ugh, if I you're going to make it later, don't say it because I want it. <laughs> the, there's a pattern that may just have been published um, of ours. Um, and this is going back a ways. Um, but I think it goes to show that we've been thinking about the kind of CHT thing, um, for some time. It's a manufacturing issue more than it is so much a, um, design or theoretical understanding. Um, mm -hmm. uh, da -da. Yes. It's yeah. If you guys haven't seen France. how the CHT nozzles are manufactured, go check out C, uh, CNC Kitchen's video on when he reviewed them. He's got a nice uh, destructive teardown of them, and yeah. you can see the angles they're drilled at and how that geometry is made. Yeah. And it's pretty neat. It's, um, yeah. It, 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 it's it's nicely done. Um, Can I send you a link on Zencaster? Yeah, there we are. Yeah, there's a chat. And we can add that link to the show notes on all the places we post this. Um, yeah. Let's see. Let me see. You need to download the PDF. And if you want the pictures, download the PDF and scroll to the end. OK. I, I'm not going to say anything. And I'm interested to hear what you think. 
just by looking at the pictures. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. I see why you haven't made this. <laughs> <laughs> It's actually quite easy to make, and that, that's why that's one of the core aspects. Um, oh, weird. <laughs> okay, so like you are you are compressing. Can can I talk about it? I mean, it's yeah, right, it's published. It's okay, you're so you're you're compressing and expanding the filament during the melt path in different directions. So you're you're changing. Interesting. You're you're like you're almost like creating a shear path in here, aren't you? So, do you know what Prandtl number is? No. A uh, Prandtl number is like a dimensionless unit that describes the fluid's propensity to transfer heat, and it is essentially the balance between or it's. it's uh, at one extreme, you have something like mercury, um, mm -hmm. which is a very conductive fluid. And then at the other extreme, you have, well, there's lava. Um, and then second to lava is polymer melts. Um, okay. And so polymer melts, they really don't like for heat to, the heat just really doesn't conduct through them. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you have to force the heat around. Um, yeah. So in like figure 17, 19, 20, like that one has a really big expansion zone at the end. It, like I can almost see how the filament would almost kind of like create an eddy current where like the melt would stay in that expansion path while pushing the solidified down into the nozzle where it would get melted again. And like you would have this like kind of like rolling current. Uh, it's one of the last no. ones. So no. okay, um, my intu my intuition is wrong. The, the this one is Excellent. um, and it, it, it's a, again a bit of an ad absurdum example, but it preserves what you call like equivalent hydraulic diameter down the tube. Okay, um, so. Any given cross section has an equivalent resistance to flow of some circular diameter. Um, so, a you know, and there are known rules of thumb for converting, say, a square tube of one by one. Um, mm -hmm. What is its equivalent um, resistance to flow compared uh, when described as a the equivalent circular cross section? Um, and there are ways to calculate this because as you go towards this more um, oblong geometry, you end up with more skin friction. So it's not just about maintaining constant cross sectional area. You actually need to do a bit more than that um, because you're introducing additional like skin friction and viscous drag. Okay. Um, so in that design, you maintain constant hydraulic diameter down the tube. So you don't actually get a constriction in flow or a, a, where it's most thinned out. You don't actually have a, a large uh, pressure differential across that most thinned out point. Okay, that's um, intriguing. That yeah, you, you broke my head a little bit. Um, yes. It didn't. <laughs> fluid dynamics never is like directly intuitive, right? No. Especially with uh, no. polymers and and melty things. So. That's really cool. I never even thought about this. Uh, yeah, we always learn things when you have you on. <laughs> and I guess so, the, the neat thing about this is there's the potential that it can basically be free to add to a system of certain construction. Um, 
So if you have a some kind of hot end that's based um, upon a you know a, a tube, um, mm-hmm. and the melt zone is within the tube that you can deform the tube with a die for okay you know a singular yeah. upfront cost of one squisher um, and then you can for zero pennies essentially and maybe a couple second cycle time add in somewhere in yeah a significant performance increase have you have you guys made any of these have you guys actually tested this yeah of course you have okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a uh, that's pretty rad um yeah i will definitely add this patent link to our show notes this is really interesting um i think for for the curious out there as to the physics of it, the pictures are, are one thing um but mm-hmm. the pictures are quite cryptic as to why the different variations exist um reading the description um Although patents aren't always the, well, they're never the nicest reading. I hate damn things. Um, <laughs> On purpose. All right, we, the, we write them we did our vague best but to descriptive. Actually, you know, describe what we did well. Um, uh, this is a really long patent. I will uh, I'll actually read this because this is really interesting. Um, but... You bringing up this patent, like it dives into a whole nother rabbit hole that uh, has been discussed on the internet. And um, just like as a time factor, I've got about oh, 10 yeah. more minutes. My um, but the. A lot of people were not pleased that you were patenting this um, and that uh, Slice has been patenting things in the industry like everybody was up in arms about it for a few weeks. Um, talk more about that. Uh, get, give me some background. Um, Cause I definitely understand. And I, I think giving you some time to talk about it would be useful. So I think it, it's very important to understand the um, wider market context um, within this, because that's a significant forcing factor um, in our decision-making process around this, because it's not simply around the philosophy of patents um, and whether in the abstract um, there's something. There was, because... There have been, like, I don't, and I don't think anyone really does know the full details of what's happened behind the scenes between, you know, some other hot end companies. Um, Mm -hmm. But if you put yourself in the shoes of um, a company who has just had um, patents used against them, um, and perhaps you are... um, domiciled in a jurisdiction that perhaps gives less than impartial treatment um, to yes yeah yeah um, terrestrial applicants and enforcement versus um, folks from 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 abroad um, you then have an opportunity to really go wild and start exploiting that advantage to an extent. Um, And then through patent cooperation treaties, pressing that advantage internationally, um, which becomes very hard to, and very expensive. And so, We're standing on the side looking in and like there's going to be a really like there's we saw potential for 
a large kind of IP land grab war mm. type situation to take place. Um, and so if you're sitting there on something that is, is pretty novel, um, but you can see the other people, you know, soon might be snapping at your heels um, or might end up, you know, essentially locking you out of um, something that you've spent a few years developing. Um, mm -hmm. One of, you know, the, the surefire way to prevent that um, is to file yourself. Um, yeah. And then there is the... So that, that, that is one aspect, but I'm not going to detract from the fact that also a significant part of our motivation is to prevent... I almost don't want to call them competitors. Um, you know, the, I, we all know the types of, uh, you know... Yes. Manufacturer yes. That we're, we're, we're talking about here. Um, yeah. Right. And Owners. That makes for a very like painful situation um, with something like Revo because it's actually very difficult to implement just right system and mm -hmm. it goes wrong in insidious ways as you've experienced. Um, if you don't get it right um, and who ends up getting the flack for that and it's very difficult for folks to understand like yeah so I mean it, in the end you're protecting yourselves you're protecting your designs you're protecting the innovation that you have put time and effort yeah. into I think it, that it, it's important to understand part of our motivation um, uh, you know a non-trivial part of our motivation is the traditional um, patent protection for, we believe we've invented something novel, we've poured mm -hmm. a whole bunch of time into it, um, and we don't think that, you know, we can see a really fair likelihood that we'd end up with a really unviable um, business afterwards. Um, if we didn't go through that protection. Um, yeah. So that like standard um, preventing other folks um, from just piggybacking um, on that it is part of our motivation. It's not going to like obfuscate from that. But there was also a, another very big factor. Um, and that factor is unfortunately still present and driving um, some future further patenting um, and before any patents like these you know, ended up getting published we want to kind of state our position and say why and what's yeah. going on and be as clear as we can um, I think it's one of like my biggest frustrations around this that I can't just sit here and explain to you what we are and aren't protecting um, in the system and exactly why and how and why we believe that that's valuable because it's still under examination and we might have to like kick that around. Like... <laughs> I understand. This and is not a situation much. that we relish. Um, right. And I think that if the market was only occupied by um other good faith actors, mm -hmm. um, then there wouldn't really be a need for this. Um, and that's kind of what I think the detractors are insinuating is everybody's here just trying to, and it's not, it's not necessarily the case. Yeah. Um, and it's like, it's a really tough balance to pull. Yeah. And I mean, would you say in short, watch Silicon Valley and maybe you'll understand. <laughs> I've not watched all of that. Um, Girth matters. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> there, there's so, a really excellent 
section of the show that goes over exactly what you're talking about with just yeah. Yeah. people trying to do great things, but unfortunately stuff happens and you have yeah. to be willing to protect yourself from what m- others may want to do with that thing that you've created. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that to be clear, what we're not trying or can be bothered with or want to do is go down this like very IP heavy, like blocking broadest portfolio Avenue plugging kind of aggressive approach that you often see in, you see in the kind of blank check industries a lot um, in your kind of aerospace and medical like um, type areas where there are very, very, very large upfront investments. And so people get extremely aggressive um, about kind of trying to lock down and abuse is a strong word, but certainly take Take advantage advantage of every angle that they can get in the book um and that's whereas we not just want to like we just want to make hot tens and then like develop the hot tens make the hot tens sell the hot tens develop more hot tens like that's what i want to do um but you're a lot like me you just want to do interesting work be comfortable and not have to fight about it <laughs> right and it's like as per the blog post, um, it, it's almost like offensively simple how it's, you know, like phrased, but it's like, if we don't do this, then there's a really significant chance because we've, you know, we've yeah. spent like everything that we like can um, getting like this system, this production line built, um, like multiple beta testing rounds with really significant changes in them. And those beta testing rounds are in the thousands of or high hundreds of units. Um, it, was, it was a lot. It wasn't yeah, like 10. And so each one of those hot ends costs you hundreds of bucks just in the manufacturing costs of those low volume run parts. Then you have to like build like it's, yeah. Um, okay. So well, thank you for doing all of that. I don't want to cut you off. I have a couple more questions, lightning please. round, and then we have to go. Yep. One, uh, where are the Revo parts being made? In the UK. Um, some are being made in this building um, and some like no more than three hours away drive. Nice. Two, what's your favorite tool or process that you acquired to make that happen. Just to be really clear before I get misinterpreted, like you can't buy a fan that's made in the UK. Um, Machine parts are all made within three hours drive. Um, Yes. Um, There are some other parts that are made America, Europe, uh, Japan. Manufactured parts are made in the UK. Yeah. 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 Fair. What's your favorite tool or process that you acquired to make that happen? It's the one that I can speak the least about, which is the the, <laughs> the system that um, puts together a Revo nozzle because um, it's a composite multi-part thing. Um, we built that from scratch. It's yes. a moth. It's like encoderized and strain gauged every like we store data from every single part you can like tell it because you're like doing this like metal to metal sealing process and you've got to like mush the metal together just right um and you also want to control the oal and a whole bunch of other factors so that it's mm. (laughs) Um, all right okay all right uh this isn't the exact question i'm going to mold it a little bit to my own desires what keeps you going what's driving sanjay right now this is the last one i think the the most exciting part is not the the technical feats of this it's 
when I look around and I see that all the engineers in the building have a little rack that they've, without being prompted or told, have attached to the front of their machine and it's got four or five different color coded nozzles on it and they're changing them in and out all the time without even thinking about it because we've Mm. made changing nozzles easier than changing filament so it just becomes part of the how am I going to print this part decision making process fluidly without even having to kind of think about it and I think that you've experienced that as well Um, I have absolutely it creeps up on you yeah this really makes me not want to start building my printer and just (laughs) (laughs) well I mean if you get a Hamera you'll be good uh you'll be good so like that's 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 the easy part that's why i've been pushing everybody around us to get hameras for the last eight months and like no no trust me hamera is the future just stop thinking about it and buy that and then we'll, <laughs> you'll be good fair enough um, yeah, right. there's there's going to be a mounting solution for everyone in almost every situation out there uh, yeah well this was incredible um we have ran right up to my hard stop and uh uh, if you want to come back and talk more about any of these things, I would love to have you. Um, it's always about trying to connect. It's fun. But, um, Definitely. Okay. Thank you so much for being here, Sanjay. Chris, do you have anything to add? No. I, I would love to, to talk more about um, some stuff in the future of just like how you guys went through the development process and all that just because I'm... I'm curious from a outside perspective of just like what that looks like, mainly because in the same time you guys have been doing all this time or all this stuff, I've been working with a company that's doing all this for the first time and it's aggravating um, to say the least. So I I really would love to hear some of like the more day-to-day stuff of like actually how you guys figured all this out. Um, But we could totally save that for another time. Talk to your customers. Fair enough. Go and stand in the room next to them. That's give them the thing. The honest problem I'm having with this this other company, they don't do that, and that's the aggra- that's, anyways. That's, that's, that's more common than wrong. not. Yeah. Uh, all right, Sanjay, do you have one any one last thing to add? No, just that I've missed you, bro. I look forward to seeing you in person. Also, maybe, maybe Murph. Battery, but Murph, Murph, Murph. Uh, hey. Hey, Whichever rough you're at I, next, I'll be there with bells on it. Yeah, um, I, I honestly thought about trying to get to TCT this year because uh, it's just like there's been no travel and there's been no friends for a yeah. long time, and I miss we'll you. We'll next but... in a couple of weeks' time. Where's that at? Germany. Ooh. <laughs> All <food>. right. <laughs> I, uh, thought. I will, yeah, I will catch you guys later. Thank you so much for being on. Uh, thanks everybody for listening. Um, keep making stuff. Please do. This is the end of the podcast. Suck it, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs>